morning and welcome back to Powerhouse. Uh, today we will be taking a look at communion. Uh, but first, did you know <laughs> that cotton candy was invented in 1897 by a dentist? I know. Bad jokers. Did you know that cats recognize their own name but choose not to respond? <laughs> uh huh. Did you know that pound cake is called pound cake because there was a pound of every ingredient in the original recipe? You never think of a pound cake. Why, why do they call it a pound cake? <laughs> now you know. One more. Did you know that O.J. Simpson was considered for the role of the Terminator, but the producers feared he was too nice to be taken seriously as a cold blood killer? Oh no joke. I, I, yeah, that's... Okay, let's talk about communion. Uh, we have learned that information plus application equals transformation. Um, now, the application part is our part. The transformation part is God's part. Information plus application equals transformation. Communion involves our part and God's part. So as we follow God, we want to do this. Uh, we, want to, we want to follow him doing his will, don't we? Yeah. Right? We, we, we're, we're concentrated on doing the will of God. We want to do what God wants to do. But what is his will? See, that's the question. So we're going to look at some things that are his will that we know. And we're going to first start off with 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17. And 18, in the passage translation, it says this, Let joy be your continual feast. Make your life a prayer. And in the midst of everything, be always giving thanks. For this is God's perfect plan for you in Christ Jesus. So we know through this that God's will, God's perfect plan, involves giving thanks, amongst other things. But we know it's starting, we're going to see a theme here of part of his will. Psalms 100 verse 4. Psalm 100 verse 4 says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. You can pass through this open gate, his, his open gates, with the password of praise. Come right into his presence with thanksgiving. Come bring your thank offering to him and affect, affectionately bless his beautiful name. So we enter into his presence with thanksgiving. And giving thanks positions us and it keeps us connected. It, it's part that keeps us connected. It's, it's strategically put in this way. Thankfulness, great, being grateful, is a response. A response has a previous action. So when we have communion with thanksgiving, we are responding to all that the Lord has done and continues to do in us and through us. This becomes our part. This is our part in it. Thankfulness puts us in a position of humility. That's the position that it, it, it puts us in. Now, humility is this. It's putting the focus on what God has done and off of what we have done. That's ultimately humili humility. Putting the focus off of us and onto something else. And in this case, it would be God. Now, giving thanks is not just a nice thing to do. Oh, that's nice. What do you, you know, you grow up, you know, and your, your child gets something and you go, 
What do you say? Right? Because we're training them. What do you say? And they, and they learn, oh, that's what you do. And then as they get older, and as we get older, we understand how that fits and what that means. Giving thanks is not just a nice thing to do. It is necessary in the process of following God. Necessary. So we have been intentionally pressing into a deeper and deeper relationship with God here. And scripture says that giving thanks is how one enters his presence. Is that important? Yeah. Yeah. It just might be more important than you realize. Psalm 50, verse 23 in the New American Standard says, He who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me. And to him who orders his way right, I shall show the salvation of God. In the Passion Translation, it says in Psalms 50, verse 23, The life that pleases me is a life lived in gratitude of grace, always choosing to walk with me in what is right. This is the sacrifice I desire from you. If you do this, more of my salvation will unfold for you. Ah. Look at what it says in look at what it says in 1 Peter 2 verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Another translation says it this way, but you are God's chosen treasure. Priests who are kings, a spiritual nation set apart as God's devoted ones. He called you out of darkness to experience his marvelous light, and now he claimed you as his very own. He did this so that you would broadcast his glorious wonders throughout the world. For at one time you were not God's people, but now you are. At one time you knew nothing of God's mercy because you hadn't received it yet, but now you are drenched with it. So as believers, we sometimes have trouble remembering our purpose in life. We we get so busy, and in our busyness of our day-to-day activity, it's easy to forget how wonderfully and purposefully designed we are in the eyes of our creator. So what 1 Peter 2 does here, it reminds us. It draws light to it. It highlights it. 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10, which we just read, brings our focus back to God, showing us that he made us to be a chosen treasure. You did not have to fight for a place in the house of the Lord. Instead, he chose you. The God of the universe actively sought you out because he wanted an unending relationship with you. You were selected by God himself. 1 Peter 2, 9 also brings our focus back to God, showing us that he made us to be royal priesthood. A royal priesthood. Now, in the days of the Old Testament, a king could not be a priest. And a priest could not be a king. The two offices were separate and distinct. However, in Christ, God has called every believer into a new category. See, it never, it wasn't a part of what was before until God in Christ developed a new category. We are now sons and daughters of the King. And we have unrestricted 
intimate access to Almighty God. That is a new category. And so we can become royal priests. Kings and queens and priests. First Peter 2.9 also shows us that he made us to be a holy nation. Now the word holy means set apart. Not like anything else. Set apart from what is the ordinary. Nation is a people. Another word for nation is people. When you see in the New Testament, in the Greek, the word that is translated into English is, is nation. But it also means people. All people groups. We are a holy people. The Holy Spirit has sealed all believers as children of God. It says it in Ephesians 4.30. And nothing can ever dissolve that relationship with the Father. Ephesians 4.30 says it this way. The Holy Spirit of God has sealed you in Christ Jesus until you experience your full salvation. 1 Peter 2.9 also shows us that God has made us to be his own possession. Do you realize how valuable you are? How valuable you are to the Heavenly Father. You. Not the person next to you only. You. You are worth so much. You are worth so much to him that he purchased your eternal, eternal salvation at a great cost. The life of his only son. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says it this way. You were God's expensive purchase paid for with tears of blood so by all means then use your body to bring glory to God nothing about you takes our omniscient omnipotent omnipresent God by surprise all knowing is omniscient omnipotent is all powerful omnipresent is everywhere this is the kind of God that adores you and know that nothing takes him by surprise nothing he made you to be his representative in the world and therefore knows you completely so we have been made royal priesthood so as believers under the new covenant we now have the ability and privilege of ministering to the Lord we can minister to the Lord. We have been all growing in the Lord. And we've learned that changing uh, the way we think is, a, is of great importance. And we go over that from week to week. We have also know that repentance is a must in our journey. Where we take the way we think and go back to the highest way. That's the way God thinks. Repentance is something that we do daily, maybe hourly, because it's not just about our actions, it's about our thinking. And when we begin to think in this way, to repent is to go back to the way God thinks. Repentance is a changing of direction of our thinking. Growing involves change. Without change, we have the tendency to get in a rut and stay there. Ruts can be comfortable. And the deeper we get into that rut, we get in deeper, deeper. The deeper we get into that rut, the less we can see. Communion is not just a religious action. It's a very personal thing that you can share, that we can share together, and we will. But it comes from a personal level before we share it on a community level. It starts here. So today, 
we're going to make communion personal. Communion and thanksgiving are connected and they go hand in hand. Thanksgiving is the time to be thankful in our walk with God. Thankfulness is what we build upon as we grow closer and closer to knowing God. How important is thankfulness? One reason is that uh, thankfulness develops true humility. Now, I say true humility as opposed to false humility. What's the difference? False humility, for the most part, indirectly defends and compliments ourselves in a roundabout way. For example, I gave up every week this month to help feed the homeless. Every weekend I gave up because there's a great need. Who got the glory on that? Yeah. Yeah. I just showed you how much I sacrificed for a great purpose. And then I, because there's people that don't, and I, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, false humility is an indirect way of complimenting yourself. True humility acknowledges that the good in your life comes from what God and others have contributed into your life. That's true humility. That everything and every good thing that you've accomplished in life is because of what God and other people have contributed into your life. So now we're going to honor God and each other. We're going to use our words, and, and then we're going to take bread and drink. And, and so what we have here is the bread. Now, the bread represents Jesus' body. The one loaf is his whole body. And we are his body. And there are many scriptures that talk about us acknowledging and experience the suffering of Jesus. And, and, and we go, How, what does that mean? I mean, we don't have to die on the cross. I mean, but what it is is, see, this represents the body of Christ. Now, when you say the body of Christ, we also know that's the church. One church, one body of Christ. And so when Jesus took his, his, his body, he allowed it to be broken, and that's why we break the bread. Because in that breaking provides the payment for everything that we don't have to pay. Now, granted, there are many beliefs of people that feel better if they can pay something for their sin, if they can do something. But the scriptures say that my grace is sufficient. There's a humbleness in that. And when we realize that the payment has already been paid for everything that you have done and everything that you're going to do, there's a humbleness in acknowledging and realizing that it's not you. It's what God has done for you. Yeah. So this represents his body being broken. And we're going to pass the plate. And actually, if you could, if you, I don't know, uh, Rudy, if you, 
Yeah, Steve, if you, if you can just hold the lock guy and then let people tear a piece off of, from your hand. With the drink and the, and, and the bread, we align ourselves with the Most High. By doing this is not only are we agreeing, but we're aligning ourselves and receiving what Jesus paid for us. And we're acknowledging this to say, we receive this blood, the blood of Jesus. This symbolizes, there's nothing about, this isn't blood. This grape juice symbolizes the shed blood of Jesus. And this bread symbolizes his body. Now here's an interesting thought. We exist in time. That's us. Time only exists on earth. There is no time in heaven. So for us, time happens. We have past, present, and future. But in heaven, it's one time. Now, it's hard for us to comprehend. But outside of our finite time thing, in heaven, when you are drinking and when you are eating, his body is being broken at the same time. And his blood is being shed. So as we take this, we don't just have to think 2,000 years ago. But we can thank him now for what he's doing, what he's done, and what he's doing now for us with the shedding of his blood. So with that, take and eat. Yeah, now I want you to look at how genius God is if, right before we eat. First of all, the food, that's genius anyway, okay. But um, all of creation is attracted. L look how this works. All of creation is attracted and bows to Jesus. All of heaven is attracted. All of heaven is attracted and bows to Jesus. And where was Christ strategically placed in us? Not upon us, not with us, but in us. So that means all of heaven is drawn to the Jesus in us. He put us right there where we have all of creation is drawn in us. Now, wherever we go, whatever we do, we have all of heaven in our corner. And then on top of that, the Messiah gives us, gives to the sons and daughters his authority. And that's what this is all about. That's what we're doing is all about here. The sons and daughters of God being disciple, learning who we are in Christ, what we have in Christ, and how to access and utilize the authority we already have in Christ. So we are being trained by the Holy Spirit how to function as sons and daughters of the Most High. And once we learned what is truth and what are lies, once we learn the authority about the authority we have in us, in Christ, the gates of hell will have no effect on us. And this is why it is of great importance as to what we believe, what we hold on to about ourselves and about God, about what is truth and what is a lie. Because with the power and authority we have, we have the ability to empower lies. And we have the ability to release the truth in our lives and the lives around us. And I close with this scripture, Romans 8, 16 through 19. And this is what it says. For the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us as he whispers into our innermost being, you are God's beloved child. And since we are his true children, we qualify to share all his treasures, for indeed we are heirs of God himself. And since we are joined to Christ, we also inherit all that he is and all that he has. We will experience being co-glorified with him, provided that we accept his suffering as our own. 
I am convinced that any suffering we endure is less than nothing compared to the magnitude of glory that is about to be unveiled within us. The entire universe is standing on tiptoe, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. That's us. So, Father, we thank you for what you're doing. We pray that you would open our eyes t- to see even more that any, anything that gets in the way of who you are in us, every lie that we have held on to that we could release and be able to see the true picture of who you are. Thank you for putting us and bringing us to this place right now by no accident. And as we eat together and enjoy the, the, the love that you have placed in our hearts, we thank you for providing, providing food, providing resources, and everything that we have. And we give you praise, even for this hot sun that is beating down on some of us. But we thank you for the vitamin D in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.